installers, water specialists, and so forth. And then we also, for many years, have operated the Gold Seal Certification Program, which, as I mentioned, um, certifies products for safety and performance to NSF ANSI standards, such as 42, 53, 61, on and on. Um, and then, of course, um, at the request of our members, uh, we've initiated this new program to certify products for sustainability. And so that's what we'll be talking about today is our efforts to create ANSI standards around sustainability certification for drinking water treatment products. So um, I think the first thing to start with is just a basic definition of what is sustainability. Um, for our purposes, a sustainable water treatment product is one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, to put a little more detail on that definition, um, it's very common to refer to the three P's of sustainability, which is people, planet, and profit. So uh, underneath the category of people is what we call social responsibility, uh, fair labor practices and impacts to human health. Um, the more obvious one would be the planet, and that's the impacts to our ecosystems. And then maybe the least obvious one is profit, which is economic responsibility. And the basic tenet there is that the value proposition to the customer must be preserved. And that's very important to us because um, we have to do this in a way that's competitive in the marketplace so that um, it's not enough to just have a product that's sustainable because if it's not uh, economically viable, it won't be sustainable for long because if no one's buying it, it's not having an impact and it won't last in the market. So uh, some of the benefits to sustainability um, do require some investment of resources, but it's our feeling that over the longer term, most sustainability initiatives provide a return on investment. And so, um, you know, the, maybe the most obvious benefit is the, you know, you can talk about it, you can advertise, you can tell your story as a sustainable company. Um, but what maybe isn't so obvious is that um, sustainability is, um, really a, a heck of a lot to do with uh, improving efficiency and reducing waste. So there are a lot of areas where you can actually produce a tangible return on investment in sustainability by saving on raw materials and manufacturing. You can save on occupational health and safety costs, uh, waste disposal and hazard management, regulatory compliance, uh, business, liability, and regulatory risk, um, and public relations and innovation. Those are all the different aspects that sustainability can have a positive impact on. And by the way, anybody, uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, so um, we think that there's a very broad constituency for more sustainable water treatment projects. Um, we think that consumers want them, uh, the manufacturers themselves um, want to uh, sort of trigger development in this area. Obviously, your environmental groups and your government regulators and agencies would like to see a uh, reduction in harm to the environment. And, um, you know, very often your distributors, your retailers, your service providers are also looking for um, ways to stock their shelves with more sustainable products. So in 2011, um, a majority of the WQA members expressed the need for us to take a proactive approach to address this issue in our industry. And so our board of directors, or board of governors rather, responded by initiating it, the development of our sustainability certification program. Um, to assist us with that, WQA hired PE International. And um, we have a representative with PE that we work with, um, who's sort of our, our consultant, and, um, and he's got a team. But uh, we were going to have one of them on the call, but unfortunately it's a, 
a holiday in uh, Canada, so they're all off of work today. Uh, but in any event, uh, PE is internationally rec recognized sustainability consulting firm. They have a lot of expertise in developing sustainability standards. Um, for example, they uh, developed the AHAM sustainability standards for refrigeration, clothes washers, dishwashers, cooking ranges, dryers. Um, they're working on a public garden sustainability index. Um, they um, do a lot of strategic consulting for sustainability as well as standards development work. And um, in particular, for our purposes, they've assisted us in analyzing different types of products so that when we write the standards, uh, we make sure that the standards cover the environmental impacts that are pertinent to those types of products. And uh, then the final piece is that they've helped us um, as a liaison to a lot of outside stakeholders. So PE's been a key part of our strategy, and um, so we wanted to give them some recognition to show the kind of effort we're putting into the scientific basis um, of developing these standards. So um, in addition to PE, we convened task forces um, and, and have sought out uh, feedback from stakeholders across the board. I don't need to read through all the, the groups on this list. Um, I'm sure Gretchen can make this presentation available if anybody wants to see. But as you can see, we've tried to pull from you know academia, from NGOs and environmental groups, from standards organizations, from government and regulatory. Um, we also have the actual manufacturers themselves that have been a big part of our effort, um, as well as retailers. So we, um, we're very proud of kind of the broad participation that we've um, cultivated in terms of developing the standards that we're drafting. So uh, the rationale for really embarking on this course is that our industry needs to move on sustainability in the absence of regulations. Um, this is an opportunity for us to build partnerships while we tackle sustainability issues. Um, it's something that we think can spur innovation and product differentiation in the market um, by providing a means for greater market recognition, credibility, and enhanced reputation of products. Um, this is a way that our members can demonstrate leadership with customers and consumers. Um, and, and we hope that in the long run it will lead to sort of raising the bar for our industry as a whole in terms of sustainability and position WQA as an advocate of the same. So that's our rationale. Um, and our goals are to create a credible set of metrics for measuring environmental claims so that customers and consumers can easily differentiate between products um, as far as their sustainability um, achievement. Um, so we set out to provide a voluntary industry equal labeling uh, standards that are based on ISO 14024, which is your type 1 environmental labels. Um, so the type 1, to summarize, means that they're multi-attribute. So unlike, say, if you're familiar with Energy Star or Water Sense, which just deal with one attribute, our standards deal with a whole um, spectrum of sustainability um, goals and performance evaluations as opposed to just one criteria. Um, they tend to be based around life cycle thinking, which we'll get into a more detailed explanation of. And um, we want to make sure that they, um, the criteria we select are um, preferable environmentally and they're verifiable. And uh, the standards need to have sufficient rigor to drive continuous improvement, and they need to be applicable globally. Um, so um, there's sort of a hierarchy of what we're trying to set out to achieve here. It begins with just compliance, but you know the goal is to have this be market driven, to engage at all points along the value change, and ultimately have a positive effect 
on the future of the products and services in our industry. So um, we, as we convene these task forces to write the standards, uh, we uh, were operating within some principles of collaboration. And um, the principles that we set forth are that the product certification standard shall be accurate, verifiable, relevant, and not misleading. Uh, the procedures and requirements for the product certification, where it says scheme, um, that scheme actually refers to the WQA program as opposed to the standards. And I should have amended this slide to say standards rather than scheme, because for the purposes of the conversation with ASPE, um, it, 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 the, our goal is to work on accreditation of the standards rather than the WQA scheme, so I apologize for that typo. Um, but anyway, so procedures and requirements shall not create unnecessary obstacles to trade. Um, we want this to be based on scientific methodology that is thorough and comprehensive and produces results that are accurate and reproducible. Um, information concerning this procedure um, is to be available and provided to all interested parties and the development of the product uh, standards shall take into consideration relevant aspects of the life cycle of the product. Uh, we want to make sure that we encourage innovation, that any type of organization, regardless of size, should have equal opportunity to certify. Um, we want to make sure that references to the product sustainability standard and the life cycle assessment guidance um, can be provided and um, that it's an open process with participatory consultation from all interested parties and um, that the end result is that uh, information on the environmental aspects of products and services relevant to the standards shall be available to purchasers and potential purchasers. So uh, we sort of mapped out a, a kind of a flow or a timeline for the different phases of the process to get these standards developed. And um, we've worked very hard since 2011 to get all the way up through phase four. And so now we have a standard that's published, but it's a private standard. Um, WQA has already begun to certify to this private standard, but obviously it would be better for the whole industry if we could make this a ANSI accredited public, public standard. And so that's where we're headed now with this process and our partnership with ASPE. And by the way, we're, we're very pleased to be working with ASPE on this project. So um, sort of the basic underpinning of this whole uh, series of standards is what's called the life cycle analysis or life cycle assessment. Um, and that is evaluating a product in all stages of its life cycle from you know, typically they talk about cradle to grave, or you could even say cradle to cradle, which adds in, you know, possible, um, you know, end of life management that goes all the way back to inputs into the next um, generation of products, or, or so that there's a feedback loop. So you want to um, consider raw materials, manufacture, packaging, use, and end of life in the life cycle assessment. And although we use these types of principles in developing this standard, um, I want to make it clear that a, a manufacturer seeking certification to these standards does not have to actually um, go out and perform a complex life cycle analysis. Those can be very expensive. And so our methodology was to do the life cycle analysis on product categories ahead of time and use that to develop the standard so that it's sort of built in and the manufacturers don't have to do it. We'll get into that in more detail later. So with the LCA process, you, you define a goal and a scope, and you set boundaries. Um, then you go about um, collecting data um, from different sources in literature as well as life cycle assessment databases. 
and you also do interviews with stakeholders and manufacturers that know the most about their products and processes. Uh, then you create a model of a product system and that generates life cycle inventories and impact assessments and then you analyze your data leading to what we call a hotspot analysis and I'll show you an example of that um, in a little bit. So um, again we we have three main sources of information we have literature review we have internal stakeholders and we have professional insights from our consultants all of which feed into this process of building a a hotspot analysis on uh, and by hotspot we mean what are the really critical environmental concerns the things that are outweighing other less major environmental concerns so where should we focus our efforts so um, just to define a couple terms here environmental aspects there are elements of an organization's activities products or services that can interact with the environment so you generally have four um, uh, main categories of that. You have your resource depletion or your inputs of raw materials, energy, and water. And then you have your outputs, um, which other than the product are your emissions to the air, emissions to the water, and your hazardous and non-hazardous solid waste disposable. Uh, you also have what's called sustainability attributes. And an attribute is a characteristic of a product or its life cycle that has a direct influence on its sustainability performance. Um, so our standards, as I mentioned before, they're multi-attribute. So we have attributes for raw material and sourcing and use, manufacturing and assembly, packaging, as well as end-of-life management. And if you combine the aspects and the attributes into a matrix, you get something that looks like this chart here and so you have your um, attributes across the top there the different stages of the life cycle you have your aspects down the left hand column and then you can sort of assign um, you know heat indicators based on the colors that designate just how critical is this aspect and impact um, as compared to the others so we again this is all to make um, all to give us the ability to focus the effort and the um, focus the the standards on where can we have the greatest impact with the least effort so that's where we create these heat maps that inform the drafting of the standard and so um, when we have accumulated all the information that we just discussed we kind of have this flow chart that determines if we've sort of achieved enough information or obtained enough information to proceed on with the process or if not you know then maybe we have to go back and do further drilling down into the details and gathering more data but eventually you get to the point where you have enough information and you draft a scoping document that explains what the boundaries of the standard are and the preliminary hotspots that you've agreed upon. Um, then you get some feedback from external stakeholders, see if they point to anything you might have missed, and then you go ahead and draft a standard and then have to test the standard. So um, the standards that we developed um, you are structured so that you have um, the product line and the ma and the manufacturing facilities scored against key attributes using a points based system and this differs from many of the safety and performance standards that we all might be more familiar with where everything is required if it's applicable at all in these standards there are a lot of criteria that are maybe applicable but they're optional and the, the idea is you have to build on enough points to achieve a certain threshold but you can pick and choose from sort of a menu uh, for what makes the most sense with your company and what allows you to get the most environmental bang for your buck so that you 
maximize practicality at the same time as you minimize cost and you give the manufacturer flexibility to design a sustainability program that works for them. So this is the way that this slide here is the way that the hotspot analysis um, gets converted into the criteria and the standards. Um, so you have your principles of collaboration and you have your hotspot analysis and that leads you to your attributes um, you know that we discussed like end of life and uh, manufacturing and assembly and then for each attribute you have a series of criteria and for each criteria there's some metric by which you measure them and then the whole thing is brought together in the certification body's conformity assessment. So we created at the outset two brand new standards. Um, they're the first of their kind in our industry and we have um, WQAS 802 which is sustainable process media for drinking water and uh, WQAS803, which is sustainable drinking water treatment products. Now, these are these two names or designations for these standards are newly revised. When we created these standards, um, 802 was just for raw activated carbon, and 803 was just for systems that use carbon. But um, in the process of getting these standards ready to submit them to ASPE for ANSI accreditation or to put them through the ASPE process for ANSI accreditation, um, we're sort of already thinking ahead. And so we're renaming these standards and generalizing them to all types of process media and all types of water filters or treatment systems. And so we're in the process of renaming them and making them more general with, with the inclusion of some specific subsections that deal with a variety of products and I'll get into that more later. But um, basically for now there's two standards. One is for media and one is for complete systems. In addition, there is a prerequisite standard that we also wrote which is the S801 standard, which is sustainable management. And that management standard is similar to ISO 14001, if any of you are familiar with that. So it's facility level conformance, but it's also a points-based standard, as we talked about a few minutes ago. And um, in order to be certified to 802 or 803, you have to be conformant to 801 but 801 will not actually be offered for independent certification. It's just merely a prerequisite. So you can only apply the certification mark if you get 802 or 803. Um, and then in addition to that management standard prerequisite, then we're also requiring whatever would be the applicable NSF ANSI safety standard for that type of product. That will also be um, a required prerequisite. And so the types of criteria that you'll see in these standards are um, corporate sustainability policies and communications, establishing baseline inventories of environmental impacts, uh, setting objectives and targets to manage your performance relative to those impacts. Um, and what goes along with that is continuous monitoring and improvement. And then the final piece is working with key suppliers. So you'll see a wide range of criteria along all of these different um, uh, you know, these different types of criteria. So um, we'll just conclude then here with um, the hotspot analysis that we um, just to give you some examples of the, the information we we obtained and used in drafting the standard for the what was 802 for activated carbon and now. I apologize, I didn't fix this slide, but what we're renaming the process media standard. So um, we actually did what's called a screening level life cycle assessment on these um, on activated carbon, and you know we determined 
the system boundary and you know what are the key phases of production that we need to take a look at so that's what's in the diagram below those are your attributes and um, we sort of drafted a set of some assumptions about different types of activated carbon depending on what kind whether they're coconut or coal or wood based where they originate from um, how their pyrolysis is what's called, called the charring of the carbon um, and then there's an activation phase of the carbon so we looked at different methodologies for how these carbons are charred and then activated they all have their advantages and disadvantages as far as the environment goes and uh, so then we th these are some of the sources we use for data collection for as you can see for coal based for coconut based and for wood based carbons we had a variety of different reports and data so we were able to compare these different types and uh, so we made some assumptions in terms of modeling this uh, production uh, flow so that we could see what were the key um, things to look at in each phase of the production um, I don't think you all need to know all the details of this but it's just more to show you how thorough we were in, in the kind of scientific rigor of um, analyzing activated carbon and carbon filters so um, we decided upon four major impact categories non-living resources climate change air and water and some of the the bigger harms that came along in these different categories and then um, this led to the this is the hotspot map for activated carbon and so as you can see the charring or pyrolysis and the activation were clearly the phases that had the the most sort of dirt associated with them um, to some extent the actual harvesting of the feedstock as well um, for instance if it's coal based that's non-renewable so that's why non-living resources was uh, flagged as being a high impact on the feedstock but anyway that this is sort of the heat map that then we used to make sure that we included all the relevant criteria in the standard and that we weighted the criteria appropriately and that's very important is, is how we actually weighted the criteria so that things that had the most benefit to the environment got the most points and so then these are some of the criteria or the attributes that we actually design criteria around fossil resource depletion energy consumption air quality human health those were the primary attributes we were concerned with for the activated carbon standard and then other attributes that were worthwhile to look at but not as high priority were um, impacts on living resources or land use um, sourcing of renewable materials um, energy consumption uh, from drying activated carbon after wa washing it and end-of-life management um, transportation was deemed to be in the scheme of things it's all relative the air emissions from transportation was considered very low when compared to the air emissions from the charring and the activation so even though things might be significant not to be ignored the whole idea of this was to prioritize and the things that were um, had the you know the largest impact and make sure we made the greatest reward for the things that were highest priority and so then the um, the other one which was the full carbon filter systems rather than just the raw carbon we went through a similar process and we looked at what were going to be the hot spots um, associated with the different aspects and um, then in this case I've actually got a little more detail on the heat maps so we have a heat map here from our public reports um, we have a heat map here from our confidential reports and as you can see the different sources of data sometimes yielded different results 
We had our interviews with manufacturers that uh, generated a third set of results. And then this was synthesized into a final heat, heat map where all these different things were combined and weighted against each other. And again, it, it became clear that the, the highest impacts were air and climate change from the raw material production of the carbon. And um, end of life was also flagged. But interestingly, it wasn't necessarily flagged so much because of its true impact, but more because in the community of our customers and users of these products, there's a perception they, you know, when they exhaust the carbon filter, they have to throw it away. They don't like throwing it away. So there's a perception out there that the industry creates waste, even if that waste may not be that significant in the scheme of things. Um, some of the, what the standard about is addressing perceptions. So this was our final heat map. And so this led to this chart of the attributes that we wanted to put into the standard. Um, and as you can see, um, for the carbon filter system, the, the highest, one of the two highest impacts was the sourcing of activated carbon. So we actually made it so that the two standards built on each other. And if you wanted to get the, the maximum points for your carbon filter system, you could start by buying carbon that was certified under the other standard. And um, I won't go through all these other impacts, but again, the whole point of this is just to show the uh, effort that we went to to make sure that our standards are science-based and um, would guarantee that they will have a positive impact on the environment. So I've just got about two slides left here. Hopefully I haven't put you all to sleep. Um, but the um, just want to kind of explain where we're going with this. So we had these standards for activated carbon and carbon filters. And as I said, we want to change those to more general standards. So um, what we've done is we've taken the, um, like for the carbon filter standard, we've taken the part that pertains to the carbon, and we've made that a very specific subsection. And so the standard will have a core, and then it will have subsections for the different product categories. And then we right now have task forces that are going through the same exact process I just showed you. We're going through this process again now, further consultation and scientific research for dispensers that have heaters, coolers, or carbonators, or just fountains, um, for ultraviolet treatment systems, and for reverse osmosis systems. And so you'll be able to use this 803 standard now that was just for carbon filters. You can use it for any type of filter or even with an RO that might have an RO membrane plus carbon filters then because it has two different treatment technologies in one product, you actually apply two of the specific subsections, the one for the ROs and the one for carbon. And so it's kind of what we call a modular approach. And there's this core that everything has to meet, and then you pick and choose whatever module you need to add on to the core to make the standard work for your specific type of product. So, like I say, if you have a hybrid device, you use all the appropriate modules um, in addition to the core. And then this way, since you don't have a different standard for each different product type, when you have hybrid products, as are common in our industry, you don't have to certify them more than once to more than one standard, and you therefore don't have to mark them. Uh, for conformance to more than one standard. So it, and then when it comes time for us to revise standards, if they're all going to share the same core, it makes the upkeep of the standard easier because if we make a change to the core, it just has to be made once. And so um, this is where we're going, what we expect to complete in the next year. And then probably in 2015, we're going to look towards softeners, distillation, ozone, and uh, ion exchange medium, media and other media as well. So anybody have any questions? Sounds to me like we're a pretty easy group today. <laughs> Um, so 
so I, if, if you noticed, I haven't actually shared the standards with you. This is more an overview of our process that got us to where we are. Uh, we'll be submitting the standards to you um, in the coming months um, as soon as we get done with a round of revisions that we're doing. Like I say, we wanted to make them uh, what we call modular ready so that we can keep adding these new product modules as we develop them. Uh, we're also revising them because in their initial incarnations as, vol or as private standards published by WQA, they had information in them about our scheme, about our conformance evaluation activities. So now we're revising them to get rid of this stuff that's about conformance evaluation because that's not appropriate for a public standard. And then also we've been certifying products to these standards now for several months and we're learning some lessons about things that were working well and things that weren't working so well. And so we're trying to incorporate some revisions to clarify some things that uh, we're proving difficult. So I expect in a couple of months time we'll have the actual standards ready to submit to you for a closer read. Well, we look forward to doing it and, and working together, so. Great. Hey, David, this is Jim Kenzel. Yeah, Jim. Uh, just wanted to add a couple thoughts and, and bring the committee up to speed on things. I think, you know, to follow up on Stuart's presentation, I think the, uh, to me anyway, one of the reasons that, well, number one, ASCII was just so excited when WQA chose us. Uh, to help them take these standards to become American national standards. And and by the way, members of the committee, one of the reasons they chose us is because of the type and quality of people we have on our committee. Uh, so congratulations to you as well on, uh, uh, on WQA choosing us for this process. But the other thing that I wanted to, you know, I guess one of the things I wanted to highlight and Stuart talked about it in his presentation is the one one of the many things I like about the way they develop their standards and why I feel proud about these ultimately getting the ASPE name associated to them is, is the amount of work that the task groups have been putting into this. Uh, you can see a lot of sustainability standards out there that are very close, that are very general standards, uh, very close to what Stuart talked about as, as his general management standard, which which the standard can be, you know, almost cover just about anything. Uh, it's so general. Uh, and that doesn't do uh, the industry well that that standard is serving or, or the consumers or any stakeholder group that's uh, looking for that standard for help in determining if something is, in fact, a sustainable design. So WQA, is, it was, as I hope you've seen in what Stuart presented, and what you'll be getting as a standard is both the general, but also the very detailed and a lot of work that went into analyzing a given product. And you'll be seeing that as, as more products and components and systems are being added to the standard. You'll see that continued detailed level of expertise and work so that when you get the drafts for voting uh, to vote on, I, I, I hope you'll feel very comfortable in understanding uh, what goes behind the information you're getting. So that's the one point I wanted to make. The other thing is sort of to give a, a uh, update. Uh, as, as you folks know, and, and in dealing with me, I try to be as transparent as I can in our process and, and what's going on. So I wanted to give you a heads up on uh, when we submitted our project initiation notification uh, to ANSI, uh, after we received uh, the or signed the agreement with WQA, uh, and and the pins, if you recall, the pins announcement is basically when ASCII puts an announcement in the ANSI's newsletter saying that we are about to start uh, a series of standards on a given scope. So in this case, it was drinking water systems uh, and processed media uh, for sustainability products. And what the purpose of the PINs is, as you may recall, is to see if anybody else out there has concerns about uh, ASPE getting engaged in such a process, 
or or if they have questions or if they'd like to be engaged or become actively involved in the process because they have an interest. Uh, after submittal of the PINs, we received one letter of concern, and that letter was from NSF International, uh, and who's actually represented Pete Greiner is, uh, works for NSF International. He's on the committee, and, and uh, I think so. Pete, you're on this call, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. But I, I just so NSF has expressed concern. And it's there, you know. That's why you put an announcement out there. And in fact, WQA and myself, we've met. We met with. Uh, uh, NSF uh, in Ann Arbor. We've had several phone conversations. And so my message to the committee is I wanted you to know that NSF has expressed a concern. They're working on a standard 375 for water, basically all products coming in contact with water uh, sustainability. And uh, so they've expressed a concern about the potential of conflict or duplication. Uh, depending on how both products end up. And so I think that we're trying to work together. Hopefully we can come up with a uh, way to resolve NSF's concerns. Uh, I will say that uh, from uh, WQA and, and ASCII's perspective, uh, we feel that uh, that it's, it, I, we don't look at it as a potential issue of duplication or conflict. We look at it as actually uh, the potential of uh, uh, as an example of NSF citing the WQA ASPE standards in their overall standard, which is covering all products in contact with water. So in many ways, we hope that that is one potential avenue that uh, we can achieve is that rather than NSF to start developing specific standards for uh, drinking water treatment systems, uh, that they simply uh, look for uh, the WQA ASPE process to complete the standards through ANSI and then adopt those standards into the uh, NSF standards rather than duplicating efforts. But we'll see. Uh, but I wanted to be aware of that and we'll keep you informed as, as that progresses. Uh, so anybody have any questions related to that issue or anything else? And then I'm, before you ask if you have any, I just stretch and wide. let's make sure they understand what the next steps are and what they'll be seeing. Uh, Stuart sort of a, uh, well alluded to it or talked about it, but I just want to make sure they're comfortable in what the next steps are. So can you do that, Gretchen? Yeah, the next step is as soon as the standard is ready for main committee ballot, we will go ahead and send it to you for the usual one month balloting where you can accept it in its entirety, accept it with comments, or not accept it with comments. And then depending on the results of that ballot, we will either go back to the WQA and they will revise the standard based on your comments. Or if you all think that it's ready for public review and comments, we will send it out to public review. Yeah, this is Peter. Um, so one of the, I guess, questions that I'd have is the, the type of information and the type of uh, assessment that you would like us to do, I mean, as a main uh, design standard committee. Um, certainly, um, it's a different group here at NSF that does our standards group and uh, sustainable um, product standards um, as well. And Certainly from a technical perspective, I just end up relying on their input for, for that side of it, and, and they give me some input already. But um, relative to, um, you know, things being done like in an ANSI process or due process or making sure that all relevant stakeholders or scoping issues or those sorts of questions, I guess. Um, I'm a little uncertain as far as our role uh, would be here. Uh, is that something that um, SB itself will assure is, uh, has been taken care of? In other words, are you just relying on the main standards committee to do a technical review of the standards that have been written and are being put uh, to us? Or is it more of a larger question um, about the entire process? Well, I think well, if it's okay with you, I'll answer that. Sure. 
I think the if I understand the question, Pete, it, it's it's really I mean any any main consensus ASPE main committee member or any member in the task group who reviews the draft can always question a process. Uh, even on the NSF joint committees, uh, a member of the joint committee at NSF can raise a question about the process as well as technical issues. Uh, so if for some reason you feel that there is a process that is defined in the ASPE procedures which are ANSI accredited that is not being followed or you have concern, concern about, I would encourage you to raise those issues. Uh, because that, that is your right as a committee member. It's, it's the right of anybody who does it in public review as well. So it, in that sense, I guess, if, 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 as this progresses, if you or another member of the committee sees something that you think we aren't following in the ASPE procedures, because remember, it's the ASPE procedures that were ANSI accredited, which we will follow to gain ANSI approval of the standard, then you should raise that and let Gretchen know, uh, and uh, and she will look into that, of course. Uh, you know, what we are doing, uh, if, if I, I don't think Stuart covered it, but just so everybody knows, uh, WQA has the, the task groups that he's talked about, which is really made up of a significant portion of the water treatment system industry related to that particular subject. So we have a very strong industry perspective, which is standard in most uh, standards development groups at the working group level. And as we progress, what you'll be seeing is we'll be adding more members of those groups onto the main standards committee as we start seeing more and more components so we continue to build and have representation on the main committee as we start getting more uh, modules of the standard developed. And eventually, and, and we've talked about this, I don't know if it'll happen, uh, but eventually we may see a, a, if enough, uh, if enough things happen and actually has enough more standards going on in other areas of the system, in that branch often create a whole main main consensus body like yourselves just focused on the uh, drinking water systems. But we'll see down the road, but we will continually be adding to the main committee from members of the working group level so that there will be representation on the committee as we grow with that. Uh, like we have, I think we have somebody on the call today that it was recently added to the main committee uh, related to some of these uh, standards we're talking about. So. Long-winded answer to your question, Pete, but I, did that answer it, or is that helpful? Um, well, it is helpful, certainly, to, to have a better understanding there. I, I apologize for asking it awkwardly, but it's, it's uh, from the feedback that I've uh, heard on the standards you know, themselves is that there aren't that many uh, technical issues with the standard itself. It's, uh, but it's coming to ASPE um, in order to become an and an ANSI standard, and it seems like that's the, one of the major gates that it's going through here. I mean, not just uh, on the technical merits of the standard, but um, just assuring that it's developed in a in a fashion that includes, you know, all relevant parties and uh, due diligence and all that sort of thing. So. Well, the whole idea is to, is to bring it to a consensus type vote where no particular interest has control. That's the whole purpose of the main committee. And it's, it's to look at it from technical as well as procedural uh, points of view. You want to add to that, Gretchen, or? No, I think you guys summed it up pretty well. I guess the main point is that when we send the standard draft to the main committee for ballot, we will be looking for your input on the standard text itself and whether you think that it will pass muster when it goes through public comment and then through the ANSI approval process. And like Jim said, if you have any questions about how the standard was developed, we will be more than willing to give you that information.
I mean, the whole goal of any standard is to protect the public health and safety. So uh, we want to do our due yeah. diligence as we go through it. Yeah, that, that's fine. I was just trying to anticipate the process, that's all. Uh, understanding that it's gone through a standards developer um, already and it's coming out and um, I, it sounds like what we'll get as a main committee is a copy of the draft standard and we'll just comment, be commenting on the draft standard and if we have any um, concerns separate from that, we'll just express them uh, directly to, to ASPE staff. Yeah, and with the draft standard that you'll receive, you'll also receive a list of the committee members so you can see the, the range of people and stakeholders that was involved. Yeah, we'll be happy to provide both the list of the active participants on the working groups that wrote these standards on a you know biweekly call basis, as well as then you know a, a wider list of people that um, were um, brought in in terms of our own public review that we did. Um, so there was a pretty good list of external stakeholders that were consulted as well. Sure. As an example, just um, and, and I, um, I'm really not uh, the kind of person here at NSF with a standards background to be able to articulate this very well. I'm more on the uh, technical side and, and crunching through the details of things. But uh, changing the scope of the ANSI standard, uh, like from 802, away from um, activated carbon to a broader coverage for all process media. I'm just, you know, trying to think through. Does that affect uh, the pins, or is there a different notification out to affected parties, or how that whole process works? But no, I point. suppose that you'll that's you'll just end up needing to make sure that as you develop these different modular sections, that you end up with uh, appropriate representation uh, within your groups. Uh, so that you have the right expertise and the right uh, um, cross section, I guess, of companies yeah. and their input. Yeah, that's a, that's a good. Way. And I think the the other thing that you want to remember, though, in fact, if you look at the pins, uh, the pins covers the broad base of all. And I, I don't remember the exact number, Stuart and Gretchen. You probably know better than me, but it was we we listed like ten or twelve different medias and process treatment systems that will be covered in the standard. So it's, uh, we didn't just submit a PINs for carbon or for, uh, you know, the, which was the original one. So I think we've got that covered in the PINs now, but Stuart, I don't know if you want to add to that or you were going to, I cut you off there. Yeah, well, just to, I, I, you, you put your finger on the, the main point as far as the PINs. I think the PINs was sufficiently general to cover the scope of not only where we're at but where we're going, but it but it is worth um, uh, emphasizing that this idea of changing the scope of the standard to be more broad to go from just carbon products to either media or systems, depending on which standard, that doesn't get done just you know by the stroke of the pen. That gets done when we develop the actual modules. So, you know, we change the name and we make the standard ready to accept new modules in terms of structure, um, but it, the standard doesn't cover these additional media types or what have you until we actually write that module. And, and to, in order to go about writing that module, we, that, we assemble a working group from that industry. So we we absolutely agree that we want the appropriate expertise that we don't just throw in an ion exchange resin module without bringing in the resin manufacturers and the softener manufacturers and have a whole working group and hire PE. Every time we do this, we have to invest more money with these consultants. So we do a, this life cycle analysis with these consultants for each new product type, it's not just something we did once and then we're done with it. This is Eric. Also, Stuart, if I could add on to that, um, 
the actual the change in our strategy to redirect the standards to be more broad happened uh, before we got involved with ASPE and, and before, of course, they developed the, the pins. Um, it, it became uh, it became a desire of our task force to broaden the standards so that they could have one standard for the purposes of labeling. And a lot of this gets back to making it less confusing to the consumers. Um, they, they were worried that they would have uh, two products from the same manufacturer sitting side by side on the shelf, one um, certified to, say, standard A, and the other one certified to a different standard, standard B, and then the consumer would be confused as to far as far as which standard is better or the the same, you know, why why are they different? And um, reducing it to one standard for, you know, 803 for all the systems eliminated that problem. And that all happened before ASPE got involved. So so that that that's why that was already taken care of when we submitted the pins. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, then I think we can wrap this up. I want to thank Stuart and Eric for their time in talking to the main committee and explaining their strategy, and we look forward to working with them in the future. And if anybody on the committee has any future questions, you can contact me, and I will hook you up with the WQA people. And I will be sending a copy of this presentation as, along with the meeting minutes to everybody on the committee for review. And if nobody else has any other comments, I think we can adjourn. Uh, WQA just wants to thank all the members for their time today. Well, we want to thank you for the presentation, and Gretchen, we want to thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. And with that, don't anybody get too cold out there with the snow. Yep, everybody get home safe. Oh, good. Have a good Thank week. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.